morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us here uh, on the session. Uh, in the session, we'll talk about simplifying data addition for LLMs with unstructured and data breaks with Chris Maddock and Colton Feld here. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Good morning. Thank you for joining us here. Really excited to talk to you about this today. Uh, my name is Colton Peltier, and I'm a staff data scientist here at Databricks. And I specifically work in professional services, so that means I build solutions for customers, ML solutions. Um, I've been here for about two years, and the first year was a lot of ML ops, a lot of uh, forecasting, a lot of recommendation systems. And in the previous year, as you can imagine, it's been almost exclusively Gen AI. Um, so I've been building RAG systems, I've been building generation systems, and um, one pain, I've ran into a lot of pain points, and we'll talk a bit about how Unstructured helped me solve a lot of them today. Um, and I'll hand it over to Chris for his intro. Good morning, y'all. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name's Chris Maddock. I lead product marketing and solutions architecture at Unstructured. I know uh, that's a strange title to hear, but that's kind of what happens when there's 45 people at an organization with 9 million downloads of their open source software. Some days I'm giving out free hats, some days I write code, some days I sell things. And my background is I spent 10 years as a software engineer, and then I've been in various engineering leadership roles, product leadership roles, uh, general management, and I've just moved into product marketing. For all the engineers and product people out there who are wondering, yes, marketing is way easier than product and engineering. <laughs> it's definitely the job I've enjoyed most. Thanks most to my partner, Steph, who's terrific. So we've got a lot to talk about today. Colton, I think you're kicking us off, and yep. I will be your slide advancer. Thank you. So why use unstructured data? I think if you're in this session, you probably have a good idea already of why you should use unstructured data, but I'd like to motivate the case for you just a little bit. Um, Traditionally in ML, we think a lot about tabular data, time series data, um, but you know when we do Gen AI, um, we really need to tap into all of our data sources. Can you go to the next slide? <clears throat> so what is unstructured data? Um, a Dropbox survey estimated up to 90% of enterprise data is unstructured. So that's everything from emails to their code bases to web pages internally or PowerPoints. Um, and as you can imagine, this is a total treasure trove, right? Like, you might have your annual figures in a structured database, but you might have a document where you presented those results to stakeholders, and it has the same figures, but it has inter interpretation on top. It has how you should read those numbers and what they mean. Um, so this is great information for when users want to find out uh, information within your organization or outside to have not just the hard figures, but the, the interpretation on top built in. So let's talk about a few of the use cases of unstructured data. The first one, which probably most of you are familiar with, is RAG. Uh, for those unfamiliar, RAG stands for Retrieval Augmented Generation, which sounds like a bit of an intimidating title, or acronym, sorry. The G stands for Generation, which is your LLM or other generative AI component that's generating something at the end, and we want to augment it with retrieval. What that means is that we want to look up relevant information and pass it to the LLM to generate the final response. So this is done by ingesting unstructured data, embedding it into something called a vector database or a vector store, which then facilitates retrieval. So if a customer asks a question like, what's our PTO policy, and you've ingested all your HR documents, it will look up the relevant piece of documentation, provide that to the LLM, which can then generate a final response. One piece that's interesting here is LLMs have a cutoff date. Right, so the last time they were trained, they don't know anything newer than that. But RAG helps us kind of get around that. So it helps us pass in up-to-date information to the generation component and let it know about more recent happenings. So whether that be news articles or figures of annual reports that maybe it wasn't aware of when it was trained. Another use case is the embedding model. So we talked about generation um, but at the, the forefront of that is retrieval, right? So if you're not retrieving the right sources, your generation's not gonna be so great. You can have maybe an early preview of GPT-5 or something, but if you're passing in the wrong info, you're gonna get the wrong result out at the end. So you may wanna fine tune your embedding models, but to do that, you're gonna need to have already ingested the documents and put them in the right format to, to fine tune. So fine tuning those retrieval embedding models is very important. Additionally, if you care about ranking of, of context that comes back, you can tra train re-rankers. Um, you can also do paraphrase mining. This is important for summarization systems. 
So that's where you look for pieces of text that embody the same idea. And text clustering is very popular as well. So this may be that you have, um, let's say, a, a large amount of documents, and you want to understand the themes of those documents. You can uh, fine-tune your embedding model and use it for text clustering, which is very beneficial for finding those themes. Of course, you can fine-tune the embedding model, but you can also fine-tune the LLM themselves. So you can use instruction fine-tuning, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in a moment. Or you can even do continued pre-training. So that's where you take a model and you train it for a little bit longer, on all of your corpus of text. You can even train an LLM from scratch. Of course, you're gonna need a lot of documents for that. But these are all possible only if you're able to ingest your own structured data on the front end. So let's talk about an example. I borrowed this from a real customer project we did, although I have changed a little bit of the, the details. But this customer had a very prolific blog, um, very big in their industry, lots of articles that went back years, and they spent a lot of time tailoring the headline, because that's what drives the clicks, right? Like people click in if they see a good, catchy headline. And they actually had a team of people that would review these headlines and work on them uh, and approve them. And we came in and, and helped them fine tune a model. It was a small model at the time. It was actually Mistral 7B to generate titles for them. So we took all of their historical blog data, we ingested it, and we fine tuned an LLM with instruction fine tuning to generate new titles for them. The whole thing only cost about $40 to do and they then had a system which was generating uh, blog titles for them in a high quality manner, and it's drastically cut down on their time of iterations around getting these, getting these articles out the door. So what's the problem, right? Like I have all these PDFs, I have these docs, I have uh, images maybe, uh, why can't I just read them in and use them? Well, ingesting unstructured data is actually really difficult, and I'll walk you through just like a really simple example here. So imagine you're doing the HR documents I mentioned earlier. Your, your company has paternity policies, maternity leave, uh, PTO, et cetera, and you wanna make available to your internal employees just all the information uh, in an easier way. So you wanna set up a system where they can ask a question like, you know, what's the PTO policy and get back a good answer. Um, you have files that are in PDF and DOCX. So this is a very simple rag in that we only have two file formats. Maybe you have a couple thousand documents that span back a few years, and there's tables inside the documents too. Some of the PDFs um, have been scanned in, so they may not have extractable text that's very easy to get out. So this is sort of the premise here, and I'll walk you through what this looks like. <clears throat> so I have two co code examples here. Uh, what, you, what you think you're gonna do at the beginning is you say, I'm gonna go grab a popular Python PDF ingestion library that's on the left, and on the right, I have a popular Python docx ingestion library, right? I have two file formats, so I need to have two libraries that pull these in. And what's the problem, right? Like, so I, I'm just gonna read in the pages here on the left for the PDF, um, and the Python docx reads paragraphs. So I've implemented this, and now I'm reading my, my stuff in. So what's the issue? Well, the issues start to pop up as you integrate these libraries. The first is that the PDF library you picked, which is the most popular Python ingestion library, doesn't support OCR. So all of your documents that you were reading in that didn't have extractable text, now you have to worry about how do I pull OCR in on top to read in these PDFs as well. The second one is, uh, what about table, table data in the PDF, right? You're getting out the text when you do the extract text, but it's all coming out as just raw text. And if you have annual reports or figures in your PDF, how do you get those in a structured way so that your LLM can retrieve the right values from those tables? And then finally, you notice that the docx library is reading in paragraphs. So not a huge deal, but we need to standardize this, right? As you get more libraries and more file formats, you're gonna notice little inconsistencies between all of them that you have to abstract and standardize on. Thanks, Cole. Yep. So I joined Unstructured about seven months ago. It was immediately very appealing to me because straight out of college, 20 years ago, fresh with my computer science degree in my hand, I got my first job working alongside the British Ministry of Defense. Day one, my manager's like, Chris, here's a load of CSV files, it's a bill of materials for a weapon, let's call it. Buy the CSV parser and then read the data in. I'm not buying a CSV parser, I'm a computer scientist. I've just got my degree, I can read in strings that are split by commas, so, I open up Visual Studio, and I start writing my C code. 
split it on a comma, stick it in array, everything's good. Oh, crap, there's a comma in the middle of this sentence here. Oh, there's an escape character in here. Oh, this is wrapped in quotes. Oh, there's a carriage return line feed problem with this one. The encoding's different. Now it needs to scale. At the end of the day, I transformed my application into a C++ application, and I was figuring out how I could use mutexes to multi-thread the reading of these CSV files. As at this point, I thought, hey, you know, maybe I should stop. Maybe I should have bought that 50-pound CSV parser that my manager suggested I buy. So I did that. I abandoned my C++, and then I switched to buying this parser. The project moved along freely, and I didn't waste any more engineering time on what I was doing. And this, I think, is where the beauty of Unstructured is and where it appealed to me. It solves the problem of my first ever humiliation as a software engineer. And we don't just do this on CSV files. There's more files than I can fit in this table right now, but we do it on now 30 plus file types and they increase all the time. Imagine the problem of reading a CSV file amplified across PowerPoint files, across Word document files, across images, emails, files, CSV files. It's really simple to use our software as well. So you can see from this code sample, this is our open source packet, and we'll talk about some more offerings we have when we get further down the line. We just say, hey, from unstructured partitioning software, import the partition, read a PDF file, and return the elements as JSON. We'll do that on PDF, docx, all the file types we say. Pip install unstructured, ask it to partition it, and you're gonna get a standardized canonical JSON schema back out of it. So this is an example of it in process. This is just a PDF file I took from archive and uh, ran through our processing. It's just a hallucination mitigation techniques. It's kind of hard to see, but this is what our canonical JSON schema looks like. And we can, I can show you this in more detail if you want to head over to our booth in hall E5, I think it is. And we can show it in detail on the computer. Everything's in the same canonical format. Title, header, footer, narrative text, paragraph text, always the same. PowerPoint file, image, whatever we take in, always in the same canonical JSON schema. While we're processing it and transforming it into that canonical JSON schema, we're also classifying it. If you can see here, this is the title, this is the text that it read. The type, it says title, it's classified it correctly as a title in this document. And you see the extracted text that came from a PDF, it's in English, its file name and its element ID. Everything we do is given a unique element ID and we're tracking against it always so we can maintain a hierarchy. This is it working on the abstract from that paper. So it's classified as type narrative text and you can see all the text is cleanly pulled out as large language, as large language models continue to advance their ability to write human-like. It's got that whole body text and it's classified as narrative text, again, with a unique identifier of where it lives in the hierarchy. Now you can see it acting on the abstract. So it's classified something of type title with unique element ID, and it's classified something of type narrative text, which is the narrative text that lives below abstract. So imagine in any document, you write introduction and you write the introduction paragraph. We know that the introduction paragraph belongs to the introduction title, that the abstract text belongs to the abstract title. And we maintain that hierarchy all through the documents. So we've been through your thousand page PDF, we've identified every title, every paragraph, every subparagraph, 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 all the way down as far as you wanna go. And we maintain that parent-child hierarchy, hierarchical relationship all the way up that stack. So effectively, from the JSON, you can reconstruct the order that we, that we transform this document in. If you come by our booth today, and please do, because the product marketing half of me has spent quite a lot of money on 2,400 trucker hats that I have to shift in three days. They're beautifully designed, but our VCs really don't like it when piles of unused swag leave the conference. So if you can come by and get a trucker hat, you'll see posted on our, our booth, we get your data rag ready. So I'm just gonna break down the six key areas we work, about, we work on in getting data rag ready. So first thing, connect to where it lies. We have an open source connector framework. There are 30 plus connectors in this framework. S3, Salesforce, Databricks volumes, wherever your data lies, we connect to it at rest. After we've done that, we route it through 
one of a multiple transformation strategies fast. If you've got extractable text that lives in the document, it's a Word document, we've bothered to learn the Word document schema, the PowerPoint schema, all of them. The text in there, we'll pull it out with Python, heuristics, regex, we'll get it out of there. If the text isn't there, we'll move to our high-res models where we've used traditional ML, computer vision, we've drawn bounding boxes around millions of PDFs to extract the text. We'll go to generative models if and when we have to. They're the slowest and they're the most expensive, but sometimes they're the only place we can turn to get that text out of the document. And if you have something that you prefer, a third-party API that works for you, just bring that and plug it into our schema. The entire architecture is modular, pluggable, and open source. We've already talked about the transform, but that canonical schema done, the mapping to each element type, the classification of each element type, the maintenance of the reading order, and the whole thing being wrapped in metadata. Where did it come from? Who has access to the file? What language is it in? How is it broken up in pages? There's 30 plus metadata elements in there as well. Last part of it, chunking. We have a simple chunking, break every 512K characters, or we have our own semantic chunking. Now, you can say I'm biased, but our semantic chunking is really awesome. There's a cool science paper on it I'll share with you. If you come to the booth, I will show the science paper and push one of our hats onto you. But the semantic chunking <coughs> understands the meaning of that document structure. So as we've already talked about, we transform it into this canonical JSON schema where we know the title and the narrative text, the header, the footer, the tables, the images. So we know where to make clean, intelligent breaks with our chunking. Behind the scenes, we call it chunk by title because it's effectively going, hey, here's the introduction title and here's the introduction text. That's a semantically meaningful chunk, so take that chunk. We're not just arbitrarily breaking every uh, 12 characters or wherever we think should be a chunk. We're understanding the layout and structure of the document and chunking on that. For embeddings, we don't care, bring your own. We're integrated with Databricks, and we'll use their embedding endpoint, OctoML, OpenAI, just configure it in our application, give us your API key, and we'll handle making all those embedding calls for you. Then we synchronize everything out for you, so to Delta, Databricks, Delta Tables, Pinecon, Chroma, Raft of every other great vector database out there, or we'll just push it straight out to S3, keeping that whole process synchronized for you, ensuring your source data is written to your destination data on whatever recurring schedule you need it to be. Thanks, Colton. There's three methods of us going to market. First, the open source. Go get that today. It's about to break 10 million downloads, which we're very proud of. It's doing about a million downloads a month. Pip, install, unstructured, and off you go. This is great for prototyping. You want to spin up a quick solution and figure out, is unstructured the right thing for me? Does it solve the problems for me? Run this. If you don't want to host it, you don't worry about security, you don't worry about scalability, and you want a really cheap SaaS product, hit our commercial API, manage it all for you. To document in, document out. And coming next month, the thing we're most excited about, and what I'll give you a sneak peek of later in this talk, is our commercial platform. It's an entirely no-code platform for end-to-end -end preparation of data for Gen AI. So what about scalability? Right, so we're talking about Databricks here in this call, uh, or in this, in this uh, speech, just as much as we're talking about unstructured. And at Databricks, we worry a lot about big data and making that simple for you. So we're talking millions of files, hundreds of thousands of files, et cetera. <clears throat> Did you want to talk to this one, Chris? Yeah, I'll talk about how we scale in our products. Um, so the unstructured OSS is in a container. Download it, manage it yourself, manage all the dependencies, uh, manage how you host it. I'm actually allowed to say this because we're not at NVIDIA GTC anymore. But this, for the GPU poor amongst us, this whole thing can run in CPU only mode and it's quick. It's been optimized for CPU and it can be deployed onto your premises. The API is entirely stateless, horizontally auto scaling, all managed by us. You don't have to think about it at all. And the unstructured platform does everything that the other two do. Entirely underpinned by Kubernetes, stateless, horizontally scaling too. Uh, Colton, do you want to talk about how we integrate this with you in our open source package? Yeah, absolutely. So like I mentioned, I'm doing a lot of these customer projects, and the customers generally have their files on Databricks, or they've built some connector to ingest those files into Databricks volumes, and they ask, you know, how do we distribute this, right? Like, how do we make a streaming process or a scalable process that can read hundreds of thousands of files? 
And it's actually really straightforward to do on Databricks with Unstructured. Uh, for those unfamiliar with Databricks uh, and Spark, uh, we, we were the original creators of Spark, which is a distributed computing framework. And part of PySpark is this concept of UDFs, which stands for User Defined Functions. And it allows you to write arbitrary Python that is then distributed across all the Spark workers. So at the top here, that first sort of paragraph, you can see a definition of a UDF. And this is saying, create a UDF that returns a string, and what it's gonna return is the unstructured JSON string. And then you can write out your, your Python uh, function just like you would in regular Python. <clears throat> you can see the content of that function is actually pretty short. If you cut my comments out there, it's just two lines. The first one reads the, uh, reads the PDF in with unstructured. So we're passing in binary content of files. It just creates a stream and passes it right to unstructured. And this is all running on your Spark cluster. The second one just returns the JSON string. And so it's that easy to distribute unstructured across your Spark workers. The bottom paragraph here shows how to actually run this with Spark. So what you're gonna do is say Spark, I want you to read as binary files all of the PDFs from this directory. And then I say with a new column elements JSON and I tell it to read my uh, UDF up there. So it's reading all of the files as binary and passing them in a distributed manner to unstructured. And you can actually do this as a stream. So that second uh, line there within the, the proc files definition says dot read. If you make that dot read stream, now you have a streaming job. So as soon as files get dropped into that directory, they will automatically be ingested with unstructured and appended to your delta table. <clears throat> okay, so we've, we've partitioned them, which is the word in unstructured for reading the original file in, con converting it to this JSON structure. Um, but now we wanna chunk it. So I'm just gonna write another UDF. Um, again, this is straightforward to do. Um, so what I'm gonna do is pass in here the, the JSON string and then two extra parameters. And these are super interesting. The first is max characters. And that's just saying I don't want any chunks to be bigger than X size. The second one uh, hits on something Chris mentioned, which is a semantic chunking. It says new after n characters. So this is saying I would prefer for you to stop the chunk after some certain number of characters if there's a logical breakpoint, if there's a smart place to do it. So to look for things like ends of sections of your document and in the chunk there. So this is really useful of getting meaningful chunks that you can put into your vector store. Now the content of this, I wanted to show you what it looks like to, to read out tables. So for anyone who has PDFs, there's probably tables inside and you probably want your LLM to read you know, the right value from those tables. And I've found on customer projects that typically HTML represented tables or JSON represented tables work very well. And so this is just showing you what it looks like if you wanna pull out the HTML. So the first line just uh, reparses that JSON string into uh, elements and the second line chunks it. So it says chunk elements, I pass in the JSON, uh, the JSON object and my parameters around the max characters. And now I have a list of chunks from the document, back from unstructured. And then finally, I just iterate through those and I say, if unstructured has detected it as a table, save it as HTML, otherwise just return the text. And now I'm actually getting all of my chunks back out. So I'm getting an array back of chunks to uh, my PySpark. And inside I have tables or text depending on what the element was detected as. So this makes it super straightforward to stick it in a vector database and retrieve it later actually as a table or as text if, if you prefer. And then finally I wanted to show you what it looks like to call the API. So maybe you're saying, Colton, I don't wanna deal with installing libraries, I don't wanna deal with maintaining that, I wanna use the API, it has, it has a lot of built-in scalability on the back end. Um, this is an example of what it would look like from Databricks to, to call the API. So you can see this is actually even more simple. Uh, I'm reading binary the same way as before, and this time I'm just initiating a pi an unstructured client and I'm passing in my binary content. And what I'm gonna get back out is the partition document. So it's very straightforward to, to integrate with the unstructured API as well. Thanks, Colton. So at the start of this, Colton and I talked about getting your data rag ready and what does it mean. I'm just gonna take the last five minutes to talk about uh, preparation of rag ready data and what the next steps are for Unstructured. So this architecture shows the end-to-end -end understanding of what we do to make sure your data is ready for Gen AI. Left-hand side, far left column, column, is all of the data sources that we can connect to. Google Drive, S3, Databricks volumes, there's way more that we can fit in this slide. They're just my favorite. Then you'll see a bunch of different file types. Again, more than I can fit in this slide and we're adding more all the time. We're, we're really focused on being agnostic of file type. Working on heterogeneous data sets is our ambition in life. 
we hit our router, and then we can pass through either our high-res strategy or our fast strategy. So these are the things we talked about earlier. The fast strategy, just clean, extractable text. High-res will bring machine learning to bear on it. Or you can call up to a third party to do that. Do you want to bring an LLM to help do this task? Do you want us to bring an LLM to help do this task for you? It's all contained. It's then transformed into our chunks JSON, the element-based classified thing. It's cached at that point. What we've learned from multiple RAG implementations is that sometimes a different chunking strategy or a different embedding strategy yields better performance the other side, dependent on data type. And our application, our new platform, is looking at that for you all the time. It's, it's pulling out a data set, it's writing summaries, it's proposing questions that it's going to ask about it and saying, hey, what's the best chunking strategy for this? What's the best embedded model for retrieval? That's where we're going with this. We cache all the data at that point so you can experiment with chunking and embedding strategies. We add summaries, again, through unstructured or through any third-party integration you want. You want to call out to OpenAI, GPT-4.0 to do this, do that just fine. Embeddings are all provided by anybody you like. We keep that permanently synchronized. This is a continuous hydration process. Always grabbing your data, moving it through this, chunking it, embedding it, summarizing it, and synchronizing it out to your relevant vector store or your S3 bucket or your Delta tables. We really wanted to do a live demo. I promise, I love doing live tech demos. But this room didn't support it, so we're going to just pretend this is a live demo. This is our platform that's launching next month. Imagine I've hit Create Source. It's an entirely no-code platform. It's super easy to do. You hit Create Source. I'm going to choose Amazon S3. It's the place where my documents are held. Our Google Cloud Storage or Databricks volumes. Configure it, done. Next is a destination. I'm going to say it's going to Databricks Delta Tables as my output. So now I have a source, which is my volumes, a destination, which is my Delta Tables. It could also be you know, S3, Salesforce, Confluence, wherever you need. And then I'll bind them together with a workflow. So my source is S3, my destination is volumes. This is my chunking strategy. This is my embedding model. This is the schedule I want you to run on. And this is the transformation strategy I want to use. And here's where you can embed any third-party transformation models as well. When they're together, a source plus a job configured by a work, a source plus a destination configured by a workflow equals a job. And here you can see the job transformation. It's continuously running. This is one of my old jobs. It's uh, SEC files, 62,000 files in, and 62,000 files transformed. The platform is due, is in private beta right now. We're expecting a more public release of it next month. The customers I see for this, I had, I spoke to a guy last week and I really hope he's not in the room. And if you are, I, I love you a lot. I'm sorry for telling this story. I'm not going to use your name. He said, Chris, I need some AI. I'm like, okay, that's cool. But what do you want to do with it? He's like, I, I just need some AI. My CEO told me our company must have some AI. Get me some AI now. I'm like, all right, okay. Well, we can get you some AI. And he's like, what can you do for me? I was like, look, here's the platform. It's entirely no code, and you can just run through pre preparing all of your data for any upstream gen AI tasks. And he's like, I've got five AI engineers. I need that. I don't even want to think about it. So that's where we're going this platform. If you're engineer constrained, or you're like me as a 20-year-old software engineer who's wasting all the time writing CSV parsers instead of working on the cool weapon bit, <coughs> I come to our platform. We abstract all of the pain of transformation of this data away. You know, just install and structured, connect to source, connect to destination, and now you're free to work on all the fun parts of Gen AI instead of the misery and tedium that we work on every day <laughs> and making sure characters are split in the right order and the word document schemas in place. So one other call out I wanted to do here is, you know, we've showed you some code and how can you get it? Uh, we have DB demos on Databricks, so you can see this pip install command. You can run this in your notebook. You can get a free Databricks community account and run this as well. All right, let's thank the speakers again. And... Thanks, man. Thanks, man.